Open your Bibles, please. Turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. And I'm going to entitle this uh, Satanic Pressure. Satanic Pressure. And you'll see what happens here with Pontius Pilate. What a, what a situation he found himself in. You talk about a man of power and prestige because he was the Roman governor of Judea. Uh... He got into a situation uh, between doing what was right and then being pressured by the Jewish religious establishment to do what he knew was wrong. And he couldn't wiggle his way out of it. He tried, but he couldn't wiggle his way out of it. He succumbed. He yielded. Now, when I taught school and I, and I noticed the, the power of, of peer pressure, it starts at an early age, you know, to go along with whatever, go along, and pressure is put upon you by friends or whatever. And people yield, sometimes giving up uh, what they know is right in their hearts and minds, but they yield in order to get out from under the pressure. That's a dangerous thing because you yield once and you yield again and here and there, and before you know it, you're, you're mush. You're mush. That's what happens to most politicians. Uh, they, they just forget it. They go with a lot. They go off to. They start their office with a lot of high ideas and ideals and whatever, and forget it. A year or two later, they they they're bargained out. They're sold out. Pilate here three times declares the Lord to be innocent. He knows the Lord is innocent. Luke at Luke twenty three, starting with verse four. That's the first time it shows up. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. You see that? I find that. He examined Jesus. Pilate asked him in verse 3, saying, Art thou a king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, thou, You said it. That's right. And the, the, the Jewish establishment in verse 2 is accusing him. We found this fellow perverting the nation. Oh, really? No, he was threatening your power. He wasn't perverting the nation. And forbidding to give tribute to Caesar. No, he never said that. He never did that. He, he always said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And when Peter was asked, does your master pay taxes? Yes, he does. Saying that he himself is Christ the king. Well, he never denied that he was the king of the Jews, but he didn't go around telling people, I'm the king and I'm going to, you ought to overthrow Rome or the present religious establishment. So Pilate knew the man was not really a danger. Probably in Pilate's mind, he was just another one of these religious uh, enthusiasts that pop up every time, every now and then, especially around feast days. And this was the uh, Passover feast coming on. So that's the first time. Turn to verse 14, you'll see it again said unto them, ye have, Pilate said unto them, ye have brought, that's the rulers, ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverted the people. And behold, what? I having examined him before you. He questioned him, he interrogated him, and believe me, Roman interrogation, that's an experience. And I have found no fault in this man. Touching those things whereof ye accuse him. He made himself a king. He said not to pay taxes. He just, Pilate is saying, as far as your accusations, there's no basis. There's no basis. But now remember when Jesus was on trial before the Sanhedrin, that's the Jewish religious ruling body, they accused him of everything and they brought in false witnesses. Yeah, he blasphemed. Yeah, he said he would tear down a temple and rebuild it in three days. Yeah, he did this and yeah, he did that. So they had all, it was a kangaroo court. They had all kinds of false witnesses. But before Pilate, they had to be circumspect. They had to be a little careful. Roman law... I don't know if you know much about Roman law. It's pretty just. It was quite a legal system. Uh, you had to prove charges. You just couldn't say, well, I heard this and I heard that. They didn't allow hearsay. Show me, like the state of Missouri license plate, the show me state. And Pilate's saying here, I have found, I examined him. I found no fault in this man. So that's the second time. 
Now go over to verse 22. And he said unto them the third time, Why? What evil? Because they told him crucify. See, in verse 21, they cried saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Uh, and he turns around in verse and he says, why, what evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. Now, this is what sets uh, the, the, the dynamite off. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. Uh-oh, they didn't want to hear that. No, no, no. They, they wanted the Lord Jesus Christ to be killed. They weren't going to settle for anything less no trade-off of prison, no anything. No, they wanted him dead. Why? They were frightened to death of him. They were frightened to death because the people were listening to Jesus and they were about to lose their power and they had quite a business going. I think I told you this story once, going into a Catholic church, the basement of the church, they had this big Las Vegas night, which was very popular back in Brooklyn in the Catholic churches back in the 60s, maybe the 70s. And I said to the priest, was it, or an assistant, I don't remember. I said, no, what if the Lord Jesus, I wasn't even saved at the time. I, what if the Lord came in and saw this stuff going on, like when he came into the temple and whipped them and everything? Uh, what, what if he saw this and, you know, uh, he went bananas with anger? And uh, I think the priest, was this, well, this is our business. And I said, you got it. That's exactly what it is, a business. So the Jews were afraid, the establishment was afraid that he would destroy their business, and he certainly would have. So what does he say here? And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. Why? He yields in this verse. Verse 24, he capitulates. He capitulates. Why? You got to look at verse 23 to see that. And they were instant with loud voices, carping, ah, screaming. Would, they wouldn't stop, requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. Well, if you're going to use the word prevail, that means that there were other voices that were also yelling out, but that those voices did not prevail. Therefore, there must have been followers, well, we know the women, Mary and the women and others that knew Jesus was a good man, did nothing wrong, they were probably yelling, no, leave him alone. He hasn't done anything wrong. But the high priests and their cronies prevailed. Why? Well, they probably had stooges in, in the crowd or people that they were able to pressure. How, how do you pressure them? Hey, so-and-so, yeah. Your son is ready for Hebrew school next year? Yeah. You want him to go? Yeah. Well, he's not. We want Barabbas freed, and we want this Jesus killed, okay? Or, or else you'll find life a little more difficult than you would expect. Same thing if you had a business. What if they told you, we know you have a business. What if we boycott that business? We tell everybody not to shop there. What are you going to do? So you're going to do what we want you to do, and their voices prevailed. Pilate couldn't do much even though his own wife had a dream. You talk about pressure. She was a Jewish woman. The wife had a dream. She's in, uh, that's Matthew 27. I'm looking it up. Matthew 27, verse 19. When he was set down on the judgment seat, this is when he was examining uh, Jesus, his wife sent unto him. Well, she didn't go in person. I guess as a woman, she wasn't going to interfere with what was going on. Have thou nothing to do with that just man? That's what she says. That's what she writes down. Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. The Lord gave that woman a dream. That was another way of trying to pressure Pilate to do the right thing. Yeah, now, you say all these things were written down in Scripture, so it had to go this way. Yes, it had to go this way. It doesn't mean the Lord ordered it and canceled out your free will. He knew the decisions that you and I are going to make with our free will. 
You see, and even though these things were written down beforehand in the scripture and they had to come to pass, the Lord writes it down the way they happened because of his foreknowledge. He knew exactly what decisions were going to be made uh, according to the pressure that was being applied. And he knows that about you and I right now. Depending upon what kind of pressure is going to come on us, he knows the decisions you're going to make. And some of them are going to put a smile on his face, and others are going to bring a tear to his eye. Yeah, that's right. How are we going to handle the pressure? You don't know. So you pray for grace. Oh, Lord, I don't want to get into that position. It's going to be really, really tough. And if I'm in that position, if you don't give me grace, I'm, I'm going to wilt. I know what I am. I'm weak. Well, here's Peter before the Lord gets arrested and telling the Lord, we'll follow you to death and all of this and I'll never deny you and whatever. And you know what happened to Peter? He wilted. Just because an accusation was made that, hey, you're a follower of that guy. I saw, I know you. I recognize you. You're one of his followers. No, I don't know the man. Was that enough pressure to make him wilt like he did and deny the Lord? And he went off and wept bitterly. What, what does it take? What kind of pressure has to be applied to you to conform with this world, to conform what others might be saying or urging you to do or whatever? How quickly will you yield? Will you have, will you have uh, clarity at that moment to call on the Lord and say, strengthen me. I'm going to stand up to this baloney. I'm not going to let myself be pressured and pushed. And I'll tell you, that's... The sad condition of the church today is we've got the church of Laodicea, neither hot nor cold. They're lukewarm, and the Lord says they make them sick. And a lot of God's people, I've said before, they, they turned into mushrooms. They just don't seem to ha have the guts to stand up and say no, no. And there's fear. I understand that. There's fear. The fear of man bringeth a snare. And some Christians are going to go through their Christian life never being able to get out of that snare. Well, what will my parents think? What will my siblings think? What will this one think? What, what will, what's going to happen to me if I take this position or that position? Brothers and sisters, if you look down the road and you try and figure out what's going to happen to you if you do the right thing, you're in trouble before you start, before you're in trouble already. Leave that to the Lord. I don't know what's going to come. Uh, people might get angry, upset for a while or whatever, and then realize, hey, this guy sticks up for what he believes. And you'll get admiration instead of scorn and mocking. But here, Pilate, look at this man. The, his own wife don't have anything to do with this guy. Uh he could, he could, he could. He was in a, he was in a very bad position. And let me tell you something: the Jewish people, especially those that are prominent and have education, is they could pressure. They have the most effective lobbying group in Congress. It's called IPAC, the American Israeli Public Action Committee, and they pressure lawmakers, congressmen, senators. They pressure them to do their bidding and to take the side of Israel in every situation that matters. Believe me, I know their pressure. It's powerful. And it also uh, involves money. They'll intimidate you with the idea we'll cut off your funding and we'll make it impossible for you to uh, have the money you need to campaign. So they know how to apply pressure. And boy, they put Pilate on the hot seat. They put Pilate in a place he never expected to be. He didn't want to get in trouble with the emperor. The emperor at the time was Tiberius. Tiberius was the Roman emperor. And the Jews would have reported back to Tiberius. They would have sent them a note saying, you know, Pilate, your governor over here, is allowing this religious fanatic to go around convincing people that he's the king of Israel. So what are you going to do with Pilate? Should he allow that? I mean, is this what you want in your empire? Another person uh, announcing that he's king or uh, getting a following? You already have King Herod here. Now put yourself in Pilate's position. And he went to hell with that. And what am I going to say? Pressure, if we stay here long enough and the Lord doesn't come for us, there's going to be situations that arise. I remember Dr. Ruckman talking about that one morning uh, at church is talked about trouble 
he was talking, uh, he was preaching out of the book of Dr uh, Dr Job. Man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upward. He knew what he said. <laughs> and he says, have you gotten past one? Okay, hang on, another one's on the way. Oh, I said to myself, what do you got to say that, Dr. Rucker? We all want clear sailing. We all want smooth seas. Come on, that's human nature. But you look down the road, you say, uh oh, I see something coming, and this could be bad. This could be bad. I remember I was in the boat with my son in law, and we were out there in the bay off Pensacola. And he's pretty good with the boat and all of that. And we were out there swimming and fishing and whatever. And it was your, it was your, Pop, uh, Tyler, you, and he says, everything's fine. I says, no, look at that black, those black clouds gathering off there, way, way out there. He said, oh, don't worry about it. I was new in Pensacola at the time. He said, most of these things uh, just pass by anyway. They don't amount to very much. I says, well, <laughs> I might be new here and not know much about the weather, but that's, that frightens me. So get this stupid boat back <laughs> to shore. I said something to your father in law. Listen to me. Move this darn thing. I don't want to be around when this storm explodes on us. And being the wonderful son in law that he was and, and has been, you know, he he, uh, he said, okay, Pop, and got it back. And you know what? I feel embarrassed because the thing really did go by us and he caused much of a problem. <laughs> but, but it was fear. Look what's coming. And most of us are like that. Oh, my God, what's going to come if this happens and that happens? And most of those clouds do pass by, and you, you, you exaggerate the fear. But every now and then, a storm cloud breaks over your head, and when that pressure comes, uh, stand, okay? Stand. Having done all to stand, it says in Ephesians, stand. Don't be like a cheap umbrella folding up with the least little wind. We got too many of them in the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. Open your Bibles, please. Psalm 116, one verse here, verse 17. I'm going to entitle this short message teaching uh, a difficult sacrifice. Uh, some sacrifices uh, are easier than others, uh, and sometimes it's very hard to offer the, the what's called the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Look at it here in this verse. Psalm 116, verse 17. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. Now, why should praising the Lord and, and thanks, thanking him, why should that be a sacrifice? Because there are circumstances that come along that make it very hard for you because of the way we are, our flesh, our ways, to give thanks to God. Uh, it's just the way we are. Therefore, thanksgiving could be a sacrifice when everything in you either wants to complain or say nothing. And yet the Lord tells us what? In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything. Now, sometimes we have to learn that the hard way, but but the Lord wants us to learn it down here before we get up to the judgment seat of Christ. And he has to bring out all these things where we ought to have given thanks and we didn't. Especially in the Old Testament, there's something here in the minor prophet Habakkuk. If you'll turn to Habakkuk, that would be chapter 3. Yeah, chapter 3, verse... Chapter 3, Habakkuk, chapter 3, verse 17. Uh, I wasn't a Christian too long before the Lord pointed this portion of Scripture out to me and had me pay careful attention to this verse uh, because trouble, trouble was coming in my personal life, and the Lord wanted me to be alert and be ready not just to expect it, but to go through it with the right attitude. And uh, I'll tell you, that, that could be a, a real trial. Look at that verse, Habakkuk 3, verse 17. And think of some of the tough situations you might have been in and how hard it might have been for you to acknowledge the Lord in that situation and say, 
Thank you, Lord. I know you love me, and I know you want the best for me. It's just that I don't see any of that right now in this particular situation. But here, in this verse, in verse 17, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. That's a pretty bad situation for a, a, a Jew doing agricultural work or ranch work. He says in verse 18, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Can you say that when you're in a tough situation and things look bleak, very bleak? Can you say that? Because that's what's being said here. I don't care how bad things look. I know that God is for me. I know that from the scripture. And I know I'm headed to a better place than what I have here for sure. So I can rejoice in that. The Lord is my strength. Not the circumstances of my life or this world in which I live and this society which is decaying all around us because of the preponderance of evil. The Lord is my strength. And if I keep my eyes on the Lord, I could say thank you even when things are really bad. Because I know, according to Romans 8, 28, he'll work them out for my good. He promises that. He promises that. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For all things, he says. Now, if you turn to, in Hebrews, you get a better understanding of why the Lord's got to do, deal with us the way he has to deal with us. If you open to Hebrews 12, beginning, beginning with verse 5. Now remember, he's, he's not just your father. He's a loving father and a wise father. And he dispenses to us at the appropriate times what we need. And there are times when we need correction. And we need to have the stick applied to us. That's not pleasant. He says in verse 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Now this happens. You get whipped by the Lord, you could despise it. You know, <laughs> and faint when thou art rebuked of him. Uh, and depending upon how sensitive you are, yeah, that could be a real problem. Uh, for whom, look at verse 6, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Have you been received as a child of God? You know that you're a child of God? Well, expect a whipping now and then. You say, Brother Militello, that's kind of, you know, uh, not, a, not a pleasant thought at all. No, but, but, but it's needful. Every child has to get whipped by a pa if the parent loves him or her. Look at verse 7. If ye endure chastening, remember Paul telling Timothy, endure hardness. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with... Number one, you might not be a child of God if, he, if you never get chastened. And number two, that's uh, maybe an indication you're, you're going to go to hell. The Lord's not going to take the time out to deal with you. Watch out. Verse 8. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, notice all, then, ye are, then are ye bastards, illegitimate child, and not sons. You were born out of wedlock. You're a bastard. It's not a legitimate marriage. You don't really have anything going with the Lord. You don't have the relationship that makes you a child of God. You might have some religious feelings. You might have who knows what. Uh, goes through your mind, and you might be thinking, yeah, I belong to the Lord. You better check that out. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. You better check that out. Furthermore, verse 9, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Uh, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? 
Wow. We had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. Yeah, my dad went after me when he had to, when he felt I needed it. And uh, I think I might have said on another broadcast, my mother more likely was just going to say, wait till your father gets home. But if I was exceptionally ornery or bad, the behavior was bad, then I remember her chasing me around the dining room table with a wooden spoon. That was her favorite instrument, the wooden spoon, and she didn't hesitate to give it to me when, <laughs> when she thought I needed it. And my mother was patient, so I had to really be doing something to annoy her to get that. I look back and I say, thank God. Thank God for parents who took the time out to straighten me out. I remember what I did once in the back seat of my dad's car driving home from uh, Howard Johnson's, really. We had ice cream that night, and I was fooling around, and uh, back there my sister was sitting with me, and we were just carrying on, and my father warned me to stop, and then he really, he reached back while he was driving and gave me a smash. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I remember that. Uh, you, listen, you can push a parent a little too far, no matter how patient they are. And I think I might have told you this when I was in Jesuit school. That was from 1959 to 63. I think either in my either freshman year or sophomore year, one of the, the rules was you weren't to, when the bell rang for lunch, you weren't to run down the stairs to the cafeteria. The cafeteria was on the ground level. And that was a, a rule. And uh, I was in a hurry to get, get to the lunch counter fast. And I was running. And little did I know, at that base of the stairs, I couldn't see, because it was somewhat depressed, and, and uh, was Father, I'll never forget, Father Friedrich Engel. That's German, Friedrich for Frederick. And Engel, E-N-G-E-L, means angel in German. Well, he was no angel, let me tell you. And he was waiting there, and I come running, I come running down the stairs, and he gives me a forearm smash right to my chest. Knocks me right down. Man, I, I went down. And he says, you, you know the rules, obey them. Wow, I got back up and said, I'm sorry, Father. Well, you had to dress him as Father. Uh, did I like it? No. But, but, you know, looking back, it was, it was a tough environment, but it taught me a lot. Uh, besides giving me a very good education, what they didn't give me, which is what I needed most, was the new birth and the knowledge of Jesus Christ as my Savior. I feel badly about that because uh, I wish if I had that in my formative years, I would have been much better along as a Christian. Uh, but the Lord knew when to get my attention. He knew when circumstances were right in my life that he can come at me and say, is everything falling apart? Are you fed up with everything? Do, do you see the emptiness of everything? Yeah, now why not look at me? Why not get interested in what I have to say? It was the right time. And I think back in my teenage years, it, it wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have worked. Uh, I'm wondering if, if there were certain attempts made when I was in Jesuit school to groom me uh, for the priesthood. And uh, looking back, yeah, maybe because I had excellent scores in religion. I could memorize uh, pages of the Catholic catechism. So they had their eye out on me. But uh, whenever the thought came to my mind, I says, no, I, I can't be a priest. I'm, I've got too much. <laughs> I got something in me that just wants to have fun, and I'm too bent toward doing wrong. I'm not going to make it. I'm, I'm not one of these heavenly angels. It's not going to work. So the Lord showed me that early on. And then he says in verse 10, I'm still in Hebrews 12, for they verily, that's my dad, my earthly parents, for a few days, chastened us after their own pleasure. Why for a few days? Because you're, you, it comes a time you get too big to get smacked around or punched, I would think. Uh, at a certain age, you can get whacked and spanked and whatever, but for a few days, at least in the, uh, in the eyes of the Lord, for, it might be some years for us, but for him it's a few days, chastened us after their own pleasure, after, to vent their anger their own pleasure, and to bring peace and order back to the house or wherever we were, the car, or whatever, for their own pleasure. But he, the Lord, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now you're saying, 
what, the, the, my parents corrected me not for my well-being and for my maturity and growth as a human being? Well, yeah, they did, but it was basically, they didn't have God in mind in their thoughts. Uh, yeah, the parent wants a child to do right, but it's for their own pleasure. The, the thing that my dad wanted most was to brag about me. Every father wants to brag about their son or their child. It, it, it's just... That's the way they are. They want to be proud of them for their own pleasure. Hey, look at my son. I remember when I graduated college, my father was, the smile across his face was a foot long. And then later on, he got another degree. He was like, wow, telling everybody. It was, uh, but the, the thing that put the biggest smile on his face was when I uh, preached the uh, blowout at the Bible Baptist Church. Dr. Ruckman had invited me down. This was... January 1994, my parents were there, and uh, wow, they, my father was so happy. Man, he just, he was saved at the time, my mom, and that was a wonderful experience for him. And then writing in the bulletin later on, and he was the first one to tell me that I had this gift of writing and I should consider writing. And that's why when I went to college, I took, uh, I majored in journalism, uh, and I did a lot of writing, even with the city. I wrote speeches for some people and union presidents and uh, a newsletter for the agency where I worked. I did a lot of writing, even for a, a, an article uh, that, I, that I, the Bronx Italo-American Times, Italo meaning Italian, the Bronx Italo-American Times, the editor there, I'll never forget his name, Frank Malerba, told me, I'd like you to write an article for us every month, and I did. It was politics, really. It was politics. And I look back and I say, my father was given wisdom by God to see that I had a certain ability. Every parent should strive to find out what their child is good at and to push that thing as, as best they can. You know, the Lord does that in so many ways, but it's, it's a secret process to us for most of the time. But the, but the motive is right here in verse 10, part B. But he for our profit, what? That we might be partakers of his holiness. That's the object here. That's the whole idea behind chastening. And when you get chastened, you offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Why? Because you know the aim of the Lord is to perfect you with holiness. Be ye holy, for I am holy. That's the whole idea. You're being whipped because God wants you to learn that way. Be ye holy. That chastisement's going to be a memory in your life. A good strapping, a good pounding will teach you things that necessarily a sermon might not teach you. And uh, look back and I think of the chastening. Wow. And sometimes you go through things. You have a financial disaster, a marriage disaster, a health disaster, or whatever. Chastening of the Lord. It's not with glee. He doesn't smile over and say... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm going to do this to you, uh, but you're not going to be thrilled about it, but I'm going to get what I want out of you, which is maturity and the fruit of holiness. Holy. I saw one movie, I'll never forget, years ago. If you can get it, if you could look it up, it made a profound impression on me. And it was the star of the movie was Jack Webb, W-E-B-B. -B. He was the star of the old television show Dragnet. When I was a kid, I used to watch this uh, police drama, Dragnet. Sergeant Joe Friday was his name in this, uh, in this television show. It was really good. And uh, he starred in a movie once called The D.I. The D.I. meant drill instructor. He was a marine drill instructor. And he was in charge of getting these raw recruits that had just enlisted in the Marines. Wow. What they had to go through to learn to be part of a team and to consider one another, it, it left such an impression on me. I says, back in those days, the military was something, especially the Marines. Today, that's another story. But if you get a, a, a hold of it, you, you might really get impressed by this, the DI with Jack Webb. And I remember one of the, the mothers of the Marines writer or going up to him saying, you can't treat my son this way or whatever. And there was... It was a lot of crying by those men. What did I get? What did I get myself into? 
But you know, as a Christian, if you're not without chastisement, you're turned over by the Lord and just left to drift like a piece of wood out in the water, up and down with the waves. You go nowhere, so you need it. And when it comes, be mature enough to say, thank you, Lord. It's what I needed. Thank you. Amen? Amen.